Tonight we're in chapter 12 here. So let's begin reading here in Luke chapter 12 at verse 35. I'll read verses 35 through 40, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 35, reading to verse 40. Jesus says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ here in chapter 12, as you know, has, has been teaching the people, and he had just given to them a parable. He had given them a parable uh, concerning what would be called the rich fool. And as he was sharing with them concerning that, he was emphasizing the fact that this individual had not prepared for eternity. And so he was warning them through this parable and through the teaching that he, he gives after that parable, he is warning them against the anxieties of life. Remember in chapter 12 at verse 15 how he had said, uh, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then in verse 23, he had said, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. And so he was emphasizing the fact that people who are unwise like this rich fool have their hearts set on the things of earth, but the wise will always have their hearts set on the things of heaven. And so to illustrate this, he now gives two parables uh, illustrating why it's important for us to seek first the kingdom of God. He had said that in verse 31 when he had said, Seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. So these parables that we're looking at, and we're actually going to see two parables tonight, one found in verses 35 through 40 and the second found in verses 42 through 48. These are parables that he's giving in order that he might encourage uh, his people to continue seeking the kingdom of God. Now, the reason that we seek the kingdom of God is because He's the Lord, we are His servants, and He has made a promise to us that we're going to be looking at tonight, a promise that He would return. Jesus speaks concerning the fact that, that He was going to return, and therefore, that promise that He gives that He's going to return is to motivate us. You see, when we study prophecy, especially those things that relate to the return of Jesus Christ, when we look at the second coming of Christ in prophecy, when you look at the various passages, and if there are so many that relate to that, we need to understand that, that the teaching that comes from those passages is intended to encourage us to serve the Lord, to be faithful as we await Him. We're going to be having a series, as you know, in February, and it starts on February 10th, and it continues to March 2nd. And we're going to be having a series related to the return of Jesus Christ. Donald Perkins is going to come in, and he's going to give us a message concerning the signs of the times. And Dr. Ed Heinsen is going to be with us, and he's going to be sharing Jesus as the theme of prophecy. We're going to have Tim LaHaye with us, who's going to be speaking concerning fulfilled prophecy credentials, God, the Bible, and the second coming. And then we're going to have March Hitch Hitchcock, who's going to speak on Armageddon, oil, and terror. All of these things relate to the last days that we're living in, and Jesus Christ spoke uh, consistently about that, as well as the epistle writers wrote concerning that, and he's introducing that subject now, even as we're going through this particular parable and the second one. And what he wants us to do is he wants us to be aware of the fact that he's returning and that knowledge that he's returning turning. For believers is what motivates us to serve the Lord selflessly. In 1 John, in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, John said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure." So the knowledge that Christ is returning is a motivator, a great motivator, so that we might be prepared when he returns. It's been said the imminent return of our Lord is the great Bible argument for a pure, unselfish, devoted, unworldly, active life of service. And that's what we see here. 
You see, this promise that he's going to return produces a, a confident expectation as well as a longing to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. This return is actually a very ancient promise. The book of Job in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, reads in this way, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. This knowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ is returning, the knowledge that the Lord will stand on the earth, is something that Job himself, a man who was a contemporary basically of Abraham in the Old Testament, Job himself was saying, I know my Redeemer lives. He will stand on the earth. And so Jesus Christ is basically speaking concerning the reality of the promise that has been made all the way through the Bible from the Old to the New Testament. Now, if people are to wait for Jesus, the question has to be asked, then what are they supposed to do as they wait? So the parables before us, these two parables, actually answer two questions concerning our duties as we await the return of the Lord. First, it answers the question, what are the characteristics of a true servant? And what are the rewards that they're going to receive? And secondly, it, it reveals that a true servant should be expectantly awaiting him and serving him faithfully as he waits. And that's what we'll be looking at today. Now, remember with me so we can establish a context here. Israel is in the process of rejecting her Messiah, Jesus Christ. And because Israel is in the process of rejecting him, Jesus now gives his instructions to his disciples concerning their future ministry. You see, his disciples are naturally going to begin to wonder what they're supposed to do in his absence. So, after his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus is going to teach them that they have a purpose or something to do. Now, what they're to do is preach the gospel. You see that in every time that Jesus Christ speaks concerning um, the Great Commission that is recorded in, in all four Gospels as well as the book of Acts. He actually gives them five different installments on that one commission, but it's to go out, and it's to go out and preach the Gospel like it says in, in Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. That's what you're supposed to do. But if they're going to be going out and proclaiming this message and awaiting the return of the Lord, uh, what is going to drive them on? What is their motivation? And so this first parable actually answers that question. They're not to be just sitting around waiting for him to come back. They're to be busy. And that's what he's pointing out here. And that's what it begins by saying in verse 35, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. So what he's doing here in verses 35 and 36 is he uses um, an illustration, a contemporary illustration, uh, and an image of a wedding banquet. Now, wedding banquets could be as short as a single meal, or they could uh, continue for as long as a week. Uh, if a person throwing the banquet was very wealthy, this wedding banquet could last for several days. And so, he uses this as an illustration. So, he says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately." And so, the master has left, the servant is left behind, he's attending a wedding banquet, and the servants have a responsibility, and that is to be waiting for him and to be busy until he returns. Now, what he's speaking about here is when the, when the master would attend a banquet, he could be gone for a long time, an indeterminate amount of time. In other words, as a master, he didn't turn to his servants and say, I'm going to be gone for this long. He didn't have the responsibility to do that. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to seek permi permission to leave. He most certainly didn't have to ask them when he could come home. It's kind of like as we're growing older now, my wife and me, my, my kids seem to think that we have to ask them permission when we leave, and, and they worry about us until we come home. It's kind of odd to see this reversal taking place right now. It's like, you know, I have to say, Anna, do you mind if I go out tonight? I'll be back by 10, I promise you, you know. <laughs> I won't drink, I promise, you know. But anyway, he didn't have to ask them that. 
So the, the picture here is thinking that the master would not be back soon could lead a servant into becoming lazy. And when he's lazy, he can neglect his duties thinking that he has plenty of time to catch up. And so Jesus is saying here that they need to have their waist girded and their lamps burning. In other words, that's a picture of expectation. They're going to be ready, he's saying. You need to be ready because the master can return suddenly. That's what it means in verse 36 when it says, when he comes and he knocks, they may open to him immediately. You see, part of the duties of the servant was to have that gate, to be watching the gate and to make sure that it was ready to be opened when the master would come back. So he's to be on the alert. He's to wait to hear the knock of the master and that knock could come at any time. It could come at night. It could come early in the morning, in the afternoon. He's supposed to be on watch. He's supposed to be there keeping an eye on that, listening for the knock so that when he hears it, he can open up to the master who can return and come back to his house. Mark tells us in chapter 13, verses 32 and 33, of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And he goes on to say, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. You don't have any idea, therefore you should be on the alert at all times. You should be careful not to get caught up with this world and the concerns and cares of the world. That's the point he's making. He had earlier spoken concerning that man, that rich fool, who had looked out and surveyed all his wealth and said, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to build bigger barns so I can store all my goods. And then I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you know, uh, take your ease, uh, be, be merry and, and enjoy life. And that's why the Lord said, you fool, tonight I'm going to require your soul. And then who's going to possess all these things that you've accrued for yourself? That's why we're supposed to have that mentality because you have to have an awareness of eternity and people who are following the Lord Jesus Christ are to have an awareness of eternity. And therefore, the things that I might accumulate today are left behind. The only things that last are those things which I have sent before me, those things that are treasures in heaven and all of that. And so that's what Jesus is speaking about. And so he says, you have a responsibility. I'm coming at an unannounced time. Therefore, your responsibility is to be ready no matter what that time is. Maybe be careful the way you live, in other words. Be aware of the way that you live. Because you can get into that unhealthy mentality while the Lord is delaying his coming. And so you can begin to live for the world again. He'll il illustrate this in just a moment. The real thing about a believer, though, is that we are awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in verse 37, he says, Blessed are those servants when the, when the master whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that, that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And so, when the master returns and he sees that you're awaiting him, he actually is going to do something that is consistent with what he had done on earth, which is that Jesus was the greatest of all and yet the servant of all. And so, it's a picture of him continuing to minister continuing to minister to people, and that's what's going to take place at the second coming. Therefore, be ready, because he can come at any, any moment. He can be there at any moment. You see, there are different ways that you can approach the return of Christ. You can, ha you can approach it with an expectation. Jesus Christ promised, and therefore I believe that, and I'm going to live in such a way that it demonstrates that I seriously think that he actually is going to return. I don't want to be caught by surprise. Therefore, I'm going to make sure to be living a life that is glorifying to him. And if that's your motivator, because the scripture tells us, you know, that if we have this hope within us, we purify ourselves even as he is pure. That means I live a holy life. And it means that I'm living with an expectation and I'm, and I'm making sure that I'm not doing certain things and doing the things that he would be pleased with. Turn your Bibles with me for just a moment to the book of Titus. I want to show you something there. Titus chapter 2. And someone may be saying, well, where's Titus? Titus is in heaven, but his book is by 2 Timothy. <laughs> Titus chapter 2, verse 11. When Paul was writing to Titus, a pastor who was ministering in, in Crete, he began to share with them concerning something related to the grace of God. And, and he says in verse 11, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, 
He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, when he speaks concerning the grace of God that brings salvation appearing to all men, it is not to be limited to the grace of salvation in the sense that we are saved by faith through God's grace. But he's speaking of a personification of grace. The grace that has appeared is Jesus himself. Jesus, who is God incarnate, God's grace living amongst us. And so when he speaks here in verse 11 saying, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, it's not simply the grace, but it's Jesus himself also being referred to here. And he goes on to say, teaching us that denying ungodly, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when he says in verse 13, looking for the blessed hope, sometimes we look at the, at the rapture, the, the, the return of Christ for his church, and we call it sometimes the blessed hope. In reality, what Paul is saying is the blessed hope isn't the event, but the person. The blessed hope is Jesus himself, Jesus who is God's grace personified, incarnated. And so God's grace, having appeared to all men, has come to teach us to deny two things and to embrace other things. We deny worldliness and ungodliness, but we embrace those things that are, 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 are going to have us prepared. We live soberly, we live righteously, we live godly in this present age, and we are looking for, see that's that attitude of expectation, we're looking for Jesus Christ, anticipating that he's going to return for us, and we're anticipating that in such a way that we're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus. And then he tells us in verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. And so, once again, this attitude of expectation, Jesus Christ is returning, is to motivate my life to be of such quality that people may know that I've denied certain things and embraced other things. I've denied ungodliness. I've denied worldliness. I want to live for Jesus Christ. And therefore, I live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age as I'm awaiting Jesus Christ. And so, this anticipation is the great motivator. Turn with me to another passage, Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 11. Many years ago, as you're looking for Romans as you're roaming around for Romans. Many, many years ago, my son David probably was about eight years old at this time. So it's been a long time. Many years ago, we were returning from a trip. We had gone to Israel and then had a stopover in, uh, in Italy. And we were flying uh, Italian airlines. And so our, our, our Israel tour group had been spread out throughout the airplane. And so David was sitting with one of his friends, uh, a young, young boy about his same age. And uh, Anne Marie and I were in another section of the plane. And, and uh, as I was there with Marie talking, little David and his friend came, and David tapped me on the shoulder and said, Dad, I want to talk. Uh, I need you to come and talk to somebody. And I said, really, who? He said, we're witnessing. Now, you have to understand, these are like eight or nine-year-old kids, right? These are eight or nine-year-old kids. And he says, we're witnessing to a man, Dad, and, and, and you got to come. And I look at Marie, and I said, oh, man, I wonder what he's up to, you know, oh, boy. So I said, okay, baby. And I, and I told Marie, I'll be back in a, in a minute. And, and I go to the back, and this fellow, this man they were speaking to, they actually were speaking to a an Italian man, he was in his 30s, and David Aaron, now you, this is just reporting the facts, and I'll develop this with you, but little David walks up with his friend Aaron, and, and David looks at this man, and he's just sitting there looking at me, and David says to this, this Italian fella, a very handsome guy in a suit, he's obviously a businessman on a trip um, doing business in the United States, but David says, Dad, we've been telling him about Jesus. And, and he, the man's staring at me while well, David's saying that. And, he, and this is what my son said. He said, 
I told him, I asked him if he knew Jesus, and he says he's a Catholic. And so I told him, you worship Mary, so you're going to hell. Isn't that true, Dad? <laughs> now, that's what David told me. What do you do? What do you do? And <laughs> the guy looks right at me, you know. And I smiled at him, and I said, no speaky the English. You know, no, I... <laughs> I looked at him, and I looked at my son, and I looked back at the man, and the man's giving me that penetrating gaze, you know, and I'm going, I said, well, son, if he doesn't receive the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior, he will go to hell. And so I turned to the man, and I said, now, my son said something that may have offended you. Forgive me on his behalf. I said, but he's only speaking as a little boy the things that he believes very seriously. I said, but can I explain to you what he was talking about? And so he said, please do. So I sat next to the man, and I asked him a question. I said, where are you from? He says, I'm from Rome. I said, you're from Rome? He said, yes. I said, have you read your letter? And he said, what letter? I said, your letter. I said, you have a letter. Didn't you know you have a letter in the Bible that was written to you? To people of Rome, didn't you know that? No, I didn't know that. I said, well, let's look at it. And we opened up the book of Romans like we just did, and I shared several scriptures with him concerning who Jesus Christ is and all. And that's why I turned you to Rome, Romans, and I just wanted to tell you that story. No real reason other than I enjoy that story. <laughs> but we have God's Word here, and, uh, and this is what he says. In Romans 13, verse 11, he said, Do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. What, are I, what am I to do? What are we to do as believers? If we really believe that Jesus Christ is returning, what manner of life am I to live? I'm to purify myself even as he is pure. I'm to make no provision for the flesh. I'm to deny uh, unworldliness and, and ungodliness. I, I'm to live soberly and righteously and, and godly in this present age. I'm to be known as an individual who is, in the King James, a peculiar person, a unique person, somebody who is zealous for good works. Why? Because that demonstrates that I honestly believe, I honestly believe that Jesus is returning over the years, I've, I've met people on occasion, not, not too often, but often enough, who are familiar with the Bible passages relating to the return of Christ. Sometimes they're, they're prophecy hounds. They, they, they like prophecy so much that, you know, their favorite books are, are prophetic books, you know. And, and yet, they may have a lot of knowledge about end times, but they're not living as if they really think he is returning. There's, there's, there's a difference between being able to give Scripture concerning the return of Christ accurately and living accurately. If, if I really have that hope within me that Jesus is returning, then I am to be doing certain things, and that's what Jesus is speaking about. He's saying there's a person here whose master has left, went to a wedding banquet, this man doesn't know when his master's returning. So what he is, is he's basically girded and his lamp is burning in the event that the man comes at night so that when he hears the knock on the door and his master's there, he can rush to fulfill his service by opening the door, admitting the master, which, in, which demonstrates an anticipation of his return, and thus he believes the man is going to come back. And as it says in verse 38, if he should, back in chapter 12 of Luke's gospel, as it says, uh, if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And so he can return at any time, second watch, third watch, that's equivalent to our 9 o'clock in the evening or 3 o'clock in the morning. And so the point he's making is just be expectant. Now, 
I want you to see something as kind of like a sidelight here in Luke chapter 12, verse 38, when he says, if he, sh if he should come in the second watch or in the third watch, this is also a subtle warning against date setting. You know, there have been people in the history of the church, there's a whole, there's a whole denomination that basically found its origin in date setting. There are, there are churches, uh, you know, uh, that are well known by name as people who basically set dates for the return of Jesus Christ. It wasn't that long ago. It's been a while now, but I, I remember, and some of you may be old enough and have been Christians long enough to remember that there was a, a fellow by the name of Harold Camping who had a radio broadcast that... Um, was saying in, I believe, in 1987 that um, Jesus was returning in 1988. He actually wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. And quite a number of people bought the book, and obviously Jesus didn't return. So the next year, he had 89 reasons why Jesus will return. This is the truth, I'm not lying. 89 reasons. And then he wrote another book in 1994 that Jesus is going to return in 1994. And there have been numerous people, you know, from Seventh-day Adventists to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who basically had dates that they had set. But Jesus here is saying, you do not set dates. He's, he's making it very clear here. And he had already, had, he, and he has said in that context, again, I mentioned this in Mark 13, 32, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And so, we are not to set dates at all. We're just to be ready. In verse 39, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, be on the alert. The master can come at any time. We don't know the exact moment of his return, so be ready at all times. Be ready always, as, as much as lies within you. Pursue him with all of your strength in anticipation of his return. I got saved, and, and one of the very first things I can remember when I got saved was people were saying that Jesus is returning. It's been 37 years, and he has yet to come back. And people say, well, doesn't that prove that he, he's not coming back? No, it just means that he's 37 years closer to coming back than he was, you know, before. I, I mean, every day is a day of anticipation. And may he come soon. May he come soon. But obviously, he's going to come in his own time. Now, as Jesus is speaking this, uh, notice verse 41. The Apostle Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? So, are you saying some of us, your 12, will not be ready? Is that what you're saying? Is this, are you saying that amongst us that, that, that we're not all going to be ready? Well, obviously Judas wasn't, but are you making this personal or is this something that is a general teaching? So, verse 42, the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him much will be required." And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Now, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice how Peter asks a direct question. You have to see this to see the context here. It's a direct question. Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? Notice Jesus doesn't, doesn't speak to him in particular. He doesn't answer that question directly. It may be that he is saying to him, don't bother asking questions out of curiosity. Take this as a warning and, and be prepared also. 
But to illustrate it, he gives the parable. This is a parable of the faithful steward. And as we looked at it, a homeowner, a homeowner leaves on a journey, leaves a steward in charge of his business, his responsibilities to manage the daily affairs of the home. The faithful steward takes the responsibility seriously, and the unfaithful one does not. And so when we look at this together here, the faithful and wise steward is obviously a genuine believer, a genuine Christian. That's because Christians are to be faithful stewards of the trust that God has given to us. Genuine Christians recognize themselves as servants of God as well as stewards of the things of the Lord. A steward is a household manager. He takes care of that which doesn't belong to him. And so he's stewarding it. He knows that he is caring for the goods of somebody else. And so that's what the Lord is speaking about here. And there's one thing that a steward is to be, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, and that's where Paul says the steward must be found faithful. And so he's speaking concerning a faithful steward, and this faithful steward is a genuine Christian who knows that the master's returning and therefore cares for his goods. And so the master has given to the steward something. He has entrusted into him something. And so what we are to do is we're to do our stewardship properly. One is God has given to us the gospel, and therefore we are faithful stewards spiritually. That means that we're willing to distribute the message that God gave to us. One of the things that I think is extremely important for us as Christians to grasp in these last days is we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are quite a number of people out there who will lie to your face, and they're not ashamed at all about it. They will do whatever they want to do in order if they can get something from you, whatever it is that they want. They will lie to you. They'll con you. They will do anything they can to get from you what they want. And they're, they're very, very intent on that. We, we believers have to, have, I believe especially in these last days, have to be aware of the fact that the enemy is working overtime to try and, and stifle the voice of the Christian church. He is trying, and, and he's being successful in, in many places, by the way. He is trying to, to cause you and me, for us who love the Lord, to become timid in our, in our faith and, and not willing to engage this world in, in the things that relate to the gospel and eternity. There's just no doubt about that. There is a constant pressure and onslaught here in the United States to try and reduce you to a, a person who won't share about the Lord, who won't talk about Jesus Christ, who may be a, be a bit ashamed to even do so, maybe even afraid to do so, because he doesn't want you to, to understand God's promises and provisions. He, he doesn't want you to realize, this is the bottom line thing, he doesn't want you to realize that, that, that if, you, if you open your mouth and begin to share that the Lord is going to give you words and wisdom that none of your enemies can gainsay nor resist. He doesn't want you to know that when you obey the commandments of Jesus Christ, that he will manifest himself to you, that there will actually be the presence of the Lord in your life in such a dramatic fashion that you sense the reality of Christ as you share. He doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want you to see the victory that you can have when you open up the Word and tell somebody about Jesus Christ and they actually say they want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. He doesn't want you to know the joy of bringing somebody into the kingdom of God. I can guarantee you and I can tell you truthfully that the greatest thrill that you'll have in your life over many things, if not all things, is when you see somebody whose eyes actually light up with knowledge that Jesus Christ loves them and forgives them of their sins, cleanses them, and actually will make them into a brand new person. When you have that opportunity of saying, would you like to receive Christ? And they bow their head and they repeat a simple prayer after you and they enter into the kingdom of God. There is something about that that is so thrilling. It's addicting. It's something that you want to continue doing over and over again. You want other people to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is something the enemy doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to experience that. And therefore, what he wants you to do is be a chameleon Christian or a silent witness. But you know what happens, man? When the Lord begins to work in your life, you become a steward of the spiritual things that he gives to you. And he gave you a message, a message of the gospel. He gave you spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are, that are working within you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 the Bible says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so he has given to you a spiritual gift, a gift that is not just for you, but it's for us. It's for us. 
It's a, it's a gift for the family, for the body of Christ. And you have gifts and, and that God has given to you that are to be exercised so that the body of Christ is actually built up in the things of the Lord. And so many people have taken the gifts of the Lord and haven't even exercised them. And many don't even know what their gifts are. They don't even know what they are because for them it's, it's, it's a new subject or perhaps an unknown subject. Do you mean I have a gift of the Spirit that, that God has given to me? You have more than one gift, undoubtedly. We call it gift mixes. You have more than one that God has given to you. Well, how do I know what my gift is? Should I take a spiritual gift inventory and, and start finding out? You know, the way you can generally know what your gift is is what gives you the greatest blessing to do. What is it that, that is so exciting to you that you, you just have to do that? Some people administrate, some people teach, some people preach, some people, you know, pray for the sick. I mean, what is it that, that, that you just find the greatest enthusiasm and pleasure in doing? That's generally what your gift is. That's generally what it is. But God has given to you spiritual gifts. You're a steward, but you're supposed to use those gifts. You minister those gifts. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, Peter said, as, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And so you steward the gifts of God, and you also distribute what he has given to you physically. You have that generous spirit to care for others. That's, that's the way it is. Generosity is part of being a Christian. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, all who believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. God gives us gifts. God gives to us supplies. We take care of people. That's how it works. And so we're stewards. So Jesus gives a promise to the faithful servant to the faithful steward. Notice verse 44. He says, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. He's going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And so we have ruling and reigning, we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ, and that's what he's referring to. Now, in verse 45, but if the servant says in his heart, my master's delaying is coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. The unfaithful servant begins to think, my master delays his coming. He's not returning. He's not coming. He thinks within his heart. That kind of thinking originates in the core of his being. He's saying it's going to be some time until the master returns. I'm going to do what I want. So he begins to lord it over the other slaves. He actually beats them and he goes out and gets drunk. What's this supposed to speak about? Well, this... Re refers to those who are unbelievers. These are people who have no relationship with God, unbelievers, non-Christians. Non-Christians could care less about any of this. And, and some will even say, now, you know, you Christians have been saying this for a long time, that Jesus Christ is returning. I haven't seen him yet. When's he going to come? He keeps saying it over and over again. And so they have no concern that he will return, and nothing is driving their life to serve Christ. In other words, they just do those things that please themselves. 2 Peter 3, verse 4 has uh, what they say. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And so they live completely for themselves, but the result is judgment. Years ago, before I was saved, my mom and dad and sisters had gone on vacation. I decided to throw a party at the house. Didn't expect my dad to come home on the day that he did, but he did. 
And when my dad pulled into the driveway, my sister Madeline, who was on vacation with mom and dad, was the first one out of the car. And she came running into the house and she said, Dad, we're home and Dad's mad. <laughs> you better get out of here. And um, to be honest with you, that was good counsel. My dad was very angry. But he came in a time that I didn't expect him to come home. You see, there are, there are different ways that you can view the return of Christ. And so I was a little boy once, and my dad would go to work every day at the same time, every day. He would leave at the same time, Monday through Friday, and would return at the same time, Monday through Friday. My dad would be rolling into the driveway around 7 o'clock every Monday through Friday, all of my life. You could count on my dad being home at that time like clockwork. My dad got home. Now, if I was a good boy, when my dad would pull his little pickup truck into the driveway and he would hit the brakes, you could actually hear the brakes squeaking and the truck coming to a stop. You could hear the brakes, you know, squeaking, you know, daddy's home, daddy's home, daddy's home kind of sound, you know. And my dad would come walking into the, into the house and my brother Frank and I would go running up to him and we would jump on his leg. And I'd grab hold of one leg and my brother Frankie would get on the other leg and my dad would try and walk with his two boys on his leg and it was like, yay, we're happy, daddy's home. But if I hadn't been good that day and I heard the squeaking of the brakes, they weren't saying, daddy's home, daddy's home. They were saying, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> I wasn't excited. Now, the, the same event, dad, it's home. Two different responses. When I was prepared, there was joy. Being unprepared, there was fear. I think that helps us to understand our concept of the return of Christ. Is there an anticipation? Is there a joy? Is there a looking forward to? Do you have this great desire to see him face to face? Are you longing for him? Do you have this, like Paul has said, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a, a crown of righteousness that has been laid up for those who, who, who love his appearing. Is, is, that, is that where your heart is? Or, or has it become clouded with other things, you see? Or is it one of those attitudes where I don't, you know, I, I don't really care. I don't even believe he's, well, that's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying that that person, that non-believer, could care less and receives final judgment. He says in verse 46, the master will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. That's a picture of severe judgment. But now in verses 47 and 48, as we close, he says, that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Human beings have, according to Romans chapter 1, they have conscience and they have creation. All you need to do is study Romans chapter 1. You can see it. It's very clearly portrayed there. Conscience and creation. Conscience awakens you to the reality that you're not perfect. Because everybody does something that violates their own conscience, if they have one. Even people who are called sociopaths, who they say have no conscience, even they will have a code of conduct, something that they will or will not do. Because we established that. You have a natural kind of conscience. And, and, and within that conscience, God can work by awakening us to the reality that we have violated it, and thus we need to be forgiven. Or you could go outside, and you can see a magnificent sunset, and, and, and as you do so, you can say, how incredibly beautiful. I have never seen anything painted by man that is as beautiful as that. Or you can get a rose, and you can put it under a microscope, and, and the closer you look at it, and the more you amplify it, the more beautiful and intricate it begins but you, to be. And then you get a, a, a silk or a, a man-fabricated rose, something that's man-made. It's beautiful. It may even have that, that, that synthetic smell to it, but the minute you put it under a microscope, you only see the raggedness and the imperfection. And, and, and all you need to do is look at that and look 
the creation itself. And creation cries out, there's a reality that something greater than you exists. I mean, that's the way it is. Any person who, who, who attends the birth of a child, or uh, like I as a, a husband and father, I attend the birth of a child, it, it just amazes you to see that, that life that, that you have begotten, that, that life that, that, that you had the joy of, 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 of having partaken in, in producing and all. And they place that baby in your, in your hands and you look at the baby and after you get over the shock of how ugly it is, it, it just it produces a, a wonder in your heart and, and you go, God, you're too much. You are too much. Look how perfect and beautiful. Look. You have conscience, you have creation. So somebody says, it's not fair, it's not fair. Well, I've had people who have been upset because people in the outermost regions of the world haven't heard the gospel, and how fair is that? And my response has always been the same. You seem to be cared about, caring about aborigines in Australia. You're, 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 you're quite a gracious person, but you're, how about you? I mean, you're thinking that you're worried about the heathens in, in, in Central America. Um, you're a heathen. How about you? Because if you've heard and rejected, well, there's this old saying, the more you know, the more you owe. And that's basically what Jesus is saying here. And I want you to see that. It says in verse 48, he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. So somebody can say, I didn't know. I didn't know. They could even come to a church like this or even this church and, and, and they could stand before God and, and then God could say, why should I allow you into heaven? Did you receive Christ? And, and they could say, I didn't know. But the Lord would say, no, that's not true. <laughs> you did know. You sat through an entire Bible study and you heard my word and you rejected. So you know and now you owe. And so the master who knows the, the, rather, the servant who knows the master's will and does it is a faithful servant. The servant who knows the master's will and does not do it is an unfaithful servant. The ones who don't have full knowledge and yet still doesn't do what God has called them to do through whatever means God has made to them possible for them to know there's a God and how to get right with him, they'll be judged too. But they have a standard that is going to be commensurate to their knowledge. We in the United States, of all people, we have heard the gospel. We stand before God with most information. Therefore, when judgment comes, it's going to be fair and it's going to be complete because even prior to coming to Christ, I had had people share with me about Jesus and how to get saved. I just rejected it. And so had I died in my sin, I had greater knowledge, and thus I would receive a stricter judgment. Amos chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. You knew, and therefore I will punish you. In James 4, 17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. There are sins of commission, meaning I have done something, I have lied, stolen, but there are sins of omission. I knew to do the right thing and chose not to, and I find myself guilty under both. That's why I need the grace of God. That's why I need God's forgiveness. That's why we all need to be forgiven by God and born again. And so as Jesus speaks here, he's saying this. A rich man, great possessions. Put all of his stock on that, his eternity on his possessions. He didn't know that the abundance of a man's possessions doesn't produce real life. And so don't be foolish like him. Seek the kingdom of God first. All these things will be added unto you. And live with an anticipation of seeing the Lord. Until he comes, occupy, serve him. 
You're a spiritual steward. Give the things that God gave to you to other people. You're a steward of the things that he's given to you physically. Make sure you have a generous heart and spirit as you do so, as you await the king. He may not come when you expect him to come, but he's going to come. He will be there at the time appointed. Your responsibility isn't to determine the time he returns. Your responsibility is to be prepared when he does. And when he returns and he sees you doing his will, he will reward you. He'll even serve you because you faithfully served him. But if you say, my master delays his coming, you're out there drinking, beating the servants, that demonstrates you're an unbeliever, you don't expect him to return. When he returns, as he will, he will deal with you severely and you will be cast out as an unbeliever and ultimately undergo eternal judgment. Therefore, if you know, the more you know, you're going to owe. So yield yourself to the Lord so that you come under his grace.